Welcome to this video on advanced analysis. My name is Mark Jenkinson and in this talk I will be discussing parametric designs. The scenario we have for a parametric design will give us a concrete example to work from but in general it's a very powerful and very commonly used type of design applicable to a whole range of different situations. The specific scenario that we'll consider is where we've got multiple levels of particular stimulus, in this case a painful stimulus. And the kind of questions that you might be interested in in that situation are, are there regions which show significant responses to the painful stimuli at all? Are there regions where the higher the intensity of the stimulus, the larger the response? Or regions where there's a linear response across multiple levels of stimuli? So let's consider the first case where we've got just two levels of different stimuli. So we've got a low pain and a high pain. And our experimental paradigm is such that we have a baseline or a rest condition interspersed with low pain and high pain. So as you can see in the, the waveform there, we've got sort of rest, low pain, rest, high pain, rest, low pain, rest, high pain, just alternating in that way. Now we could put in a design matrix where we had a single EV like this one, where it was coded to be zero for the rest condition, a value of one for the low pain and a value of two for the high pain. And that is one possible way that we could look at doing analysis like that, but it's not a good way. And the reason that it's not a good way is that it makes a very, very strict assumption that the response that we get from our MRI measurements of the neuronal response to this type of stimulus will be exactly twice when it's high pain as opposed to low pain. And we don't know that that's true. In fact, it's extremely unlikely to be true because how have we decided what's low and what's high? And the fact that the MRI gives you a nonlinear measurement of what's going on because of all the bold effect and everything else that it's having to work out. And that actually we know that the neuronal processing in the brain is very nonlinear. So the chances of us having a predictive value in this case a factor of two between our two different cases, is a very strong assumption and very unlikely to be true. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to presuppose that. Instead, we want something which is more flexible, and we can easily do that within the GLM simply by associating a different parameter with each of these two different conditions. So we'd have a separate parameter for high pain, and that would represent what is the level of response that we see in the high pain condition, and a separate parameter associated with the low pain. So that's a parameter is a PE or a beta value. And so we simply, by setting up two different EVs, we would have a parameter for each EV. And so in this case, we've separated out all the high pain conditions and put them in EV1, and we've separated out all the low pain conditions and put them in EV2. And as usual, our baseline rest condition in this case is implicit. So by setting up our design matrix like this, we can then ask different questions about what's going on. So we've got two different EVs and we can ask a range of different contrasts. So one of them we can formulate is a zero one contrast. And it's putting zero on the high pain EV, EV1, and plus one on the low pain. And that's going to ask the question, when do we see an activation, a response, during the low pain stimuli, which is greater than rest. So we're saying, when do we actually see some activation during the low pain conditions compared to rest? Alternatively, we can ask about the difference between different conditions. So a plus one, minus one contrast would ask, where do we see a response which is greater for high pain than it is for low pain? And similarly, we could flip it around and do a minus one plus one contrast to look for areas where we actually had a stronger response in the low pain condition than we do in the high pain condition. And actually, that does occur in the brain. So this allows us to ask a whole range of interesting questions, including something like this, a plus one plus one contrast, which is simply asks what is the average response to those two different conditions compared to our rest, our baseline. So there are at least five different contrasts that you could ask here. You could always also ask about when the contrasts are less than the baseline, the individual ones, and that would be something like a minus one, zero contrast. And sometimes that is interesting to, to look at as well. So simply by 
Setting up the design matrix this way, we've given ourselves the flexibility to cope with the fact that we don't know at each different voxel what the level of response will be to the two different conditions. And then we can ask lots of different questions about the relationship between those two. And it's likely to be different in different locations within the brain. So it allows us to look at that and look at that in different regions. So that's a simple case where we've just got two different levels. What if we've got more levels? And when, once we get into three levels or more, we're often interested in what is the trend? What is the shape of the response that we see? So for instance, here we've got a plot of the stimulus intensity on the x-axis and the bold signal effect size or a parameter estimate or beta on the y-axis and three different points. And so we've got three different levels of stimulus, low, medium and high. And we are looking at what is the relationship of bold with respect to the stimulus intensity. And here we've fitted a line to it. And it's very common that we are interested in looking at that kind of linear trend. So if that's the situation we're in, how do I actually set something up within the GLM to do that? Well, this is what we, it would look like. We would have three different EVs, one for low, one for medium and one for high. And that is the, the three different levels of the stimulus that we have. And then we would set up uh, different contrasts. We can set up, in this case, the first three contrasts, the simple ones, they're just low on its own. So that would be low compared to uh, baseline or rest, medium versus baseline and high versus baseline. So in each case, there, there's just a single one and the other two are zero, which is effectively ignoring them. Then if we want to look at a linear trend, what we would do is we would set up a, a T contrast, which was minus one, zero, plus one that would look for a positive linear trend. And so if we consider what happens if we've got our three different points, then what we're interested in is finding the slope of that line. And that's what that linear trend is going to look for. But you might have realized that actually by setting it up in this way, I've got a zero in the middle, which is effectively ignoring that middle point. And surely I shouldn't be ignoring that middle point. Well, actually, consider what happens if the middle point does move. If that middle point was substantially lower than it is on the left-hand side there, what we would see, and the other two values are the same, what we would see is we would fit a line which has exactly the same slope. So the middle point actually has no impact on the slope in this particular case, when we've just got three values. In that case, the middle point affects where the intercept of that line would be, but it does not affect the slope. And the slope is what we're interested in, in terms of looking at a linear trend and whether there's any relationship between the level of the stimulus and the bold effect. And so it's just a coincidence that in this particular case, we end up with a zero in the middle. We need our contrast to be centered around zero because we don't want it to actually be telling us about the intercept. It needs to be just telling us purely about the slope. And we get that by making sure that our contrast is centered around zero. The, the three different values in this case are centered around zero and however many values we would have if we had more levels. But in this particular case, that middle point doesn't affect our slope, so it's not included. If we want to look for a negative trend, we would actually reverse the contrast. So we'd have plus one, zero and minus one. And that's effectively looking for when the slope is less than zero. So this T contrast to begin with, our minus one, zero, plus one, that looks for when the slope is greater than zero. And we would normally put in both of those contrasts because we would be interested to know when we were in the case where we had a, a positive trend, uh, a slope which was greater than zero when we were in, or when we we're in the situation where we had a negative trend, the slope was less than zero. If we have more levels, say we've, we've got four different levels now, what do we do to actually create our linear trend contrast? Well, it actually looks like this. Minus three, minus one, plus one, plus three. And that might seem odd. Why haven't I chosen two instead of three? Well, the reason is this. If you actually plot those values, you can see that the ones with the minus three actually creates a line and that's centered about zero. If you use the minus two, minus one, one and two, you don't get a line because actually the interval between the outer two values is just one, but the difference between the middle two values is a difference of two. 
And so it's an uneven difference between the different pairs and hence it's not a line, at which you can see in the plot there. So it's important that whatever the values are, you have actually form a line if you plot them out and that they are centered about zero. And they're the two things that you need to keep in mind when you're formulating a linear trend contrast. But if I keep going and I have more and more levels, there are more interesting things that could happen as well beyond what would happen with just a linear contrast. So let's consider this example now. So this is about looking at processing words. And so this is an experiment where we've got different word presentation rates. That is how fast we're presenting words. One of the levels is 100 words per minute, which is fairly slow. And then there's 200 words per minute, 300 words per minute, and up to 500 words a minute. So we've got five different levels at increasing speeds of word presentation. And we're interested in what is the brain doing, particularly the language areas. And what it might be doing is something like you, you can see in this example plot here, which is actually some inverted U case, because in the case that the word rate is very low, then there's not much to do. If I talk like this, your brain doesn't have to work very hard. Whereas if I talk like this and it's far too fast, then also your brain might not work particularly well if it's that fast, because it might not be able to understand what's going on. So there's a sweet spot in the middle where you're actually, you're optimally processing these words. And so this inverted U is actually, you know, a reasonable thing that may happen, but we don't really know. And so what we would like to do is we would like to see what kind of relationship we've got and, and test for it and find the areas of the brain where we are actually getting interesting relationships. But if we formulate it in a particular way, we might not see that. So if we do the kind of formulation that, we, that we've had before, then we might say, look at the difference between two different things, two different presentation rates. If we looked at the difference between the greatest one and the lowest one, the fastest and the slowest, in if they happen to be like this, then we would see no difference. But actually, that doesn't tell us the whole story because there is actually a lot of difference if we looked at all of them. So ignoring the middle ones is not a good idea. So we need something else. If we just looked at the average of them all, then that really doesn't tell us what the relationship is like. That just tells us that an area is doing something with respect to words, but it doesn't tell us if it is responding to different word presentation rates. And so actually a linear trend in this case is no good because that is what the linear fit looks like. So it's, it's flat. It looks like there's no relationship, but actually we can see there's a relationship. It's just not a linear relationship. So what do we do if these kind of things don't work out? Well, maybe we could formulate a contrast which was like this. So it was minus two, plus one, plus two, plus one minus two and that would fit these particular points beautifully but actually what are the chances that you're going to get those numbers right and that it's going to look exactly like this example and for all of the points in the brain where there might be something interesting going on so really it's not very likely that you would be able to formulate that question without knowing what the data looks like and without knowing a lot about what you're investigating which is the point of investigating it is you normally don't know what it is and you want to find out so we need better tools than this. So what can we do about that? Well, we don't want to miss out on different shapes. So we want something which can cope with a range of different shapes. And actually F contrasts are a great way of trying to look at all different combinations of things. Because F contrasts combine together different things. So they can combine together different T contrasts, and then they really are asking questions of, do I see something in this case or in that case or, or both cases? And so air contrasts are very good for collecting things together like this. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to formulate an F contrast in this way. We're going to take the first pair and create a T contrast across that pair. And then we're going to create a T contrast across the second pair and the third pair and the fourth pair. And then we put an F contrast, which combines all of those together. And so that's going to respond to any case where we see a difference between the first two presentation rates or the second two or the third two or the last two. Okay. And so that actually covers the range of things that we're interested in. Though you might not immediately see that. 
because for instance what happens about comparing the first one and the third one well that's all right because that's already been covered because the only way that the first and the third one can be different is if either the first and the second are different or the second and the third are different and both those cases the first and the second and the second and the third are individual t-contrasts which we've already included in our f-contrast and our f-contrast is asking the question do i see a difference in the first pair or the second pair or both and so if there is a difference between the first and the third case we've already got that covered because it's going to also be in at least one of these other two pairs but what about this kind of case where actually it's decreased well that's also fine because unlike t contrasts f contrasts work in both directions so they don't care whether it's going up or it's going down t contrasts are signed they're only going to look for one particular way around but f contrasts also automatically include the opposite sign and so it would pick up a case where in in this particular example we have the second presentation rate has less aggravation than the first and so it's going down that would also be covered by the f test and so actually this f test covers everything that we we need it to cover four different t contrasts put into it across all of these four different pairs actually covers all the possible shapes that you could have which are interesting in this case so it will look for any instance where changing the word presentation rate changes the level of the activation if they're all exactly the same then this f test would show you nothing so they could all be very high they could be all very different from baseline and this f test wouldn't show you anything because it's not looking for that if you're interested in that you can just do a simple mean contrast one 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 across all of them and the simple mean t contrast would tell you whether the average is significantly different from baseline or not but in this kind of situation in a parametric design that's normally not the question that we're interested in we're interested in the question of if changing the level of the the stimulus or the, the type of the stimulus so in this case the word presentation rate does that change the activation that we see and so we're looking for changes in response to changes of the level and this kind of f contrast is a great way of seeing that and so in summary we've looked at parametric designs which are used in all sorts of different situations it's important to have separate evs and separate parameters for each level of stimulus that you have so that it can actually model what that level is and it's not making any assumptions about that beforehand if you want to look for a linear trend when you've got three or more levels then you simply need to have a, a contrast which is centered about zero and which has even intervals and remember that positive contrast and negative contrast should be also be included because looking for positive slopes and negative slopes will be separate when you're looking at t contrasts and then going beyond linear trends can be done with f tests to look for all sorts of different arbitrary response shapes which are interesting and are telling you that the activation or whatever we're measuring because this could be in the context of other kinds of experiments as well not just fmi could be in the context of doing experiments with diffusion imaging or with structural imaging anything where we've got a glm where we've got different levels and we want to investigate it can be investigated in this way to look for changes where our outcome measure in this case activation depends on the level of something that we're introducing into the experimental design